So um, this session is till 9.50. Um, we're going to talk about remote work, uh, cybersecurity, um, specific to nonprofit and fraud and, and a, lot of, a lot of good things about that. Um, my name is Tony Lanaza. I am the uh, director of fraud and forensic at HW and Company, as well as a principal. And Mike Schaffner is the chief compliance and security officer here at HW and Company. And we'll be speaking, um, you know, really focusing on the cyber security, cyber fraud side. So um, if, if anyone does have questions, there's a chat box that you can post questions in. Um, you know, hopefully we can get to some of them throughout the session. If not, we can uh, hopefully address at the end. If, you know, if we can't get to some, we'll try to get back to you at some point. So again, you know, we'd like to have it interactive. So if there is any questions, just, you know, try to, try to post it and we'll, we'll try to get to it. Okay, so the objectives for the next, let's say, what, 45 minutes, you know, we're going to talk about just broad risks in general, and some of them being specific to remote work, um, you know, with the environment we're in right now, you know, you're hearing a lot about fraud, um, not just about, not just with occupational fraud, but um, cyber fraud as well, and just the infiltration of these, these issues and risks coming into businesses. So, We'll be talking about fraud risk. Um, you can't talk about fraud without mentioning the fraud triangle. You can see the three items under that. We'll get into those three items. We'll talk about, you know, what the pressure, what the opportunity is, and what the rationalization that people and organizations go through um, prior to fraud. And, you know, we'll, we'll kind of dig into, you know, what businesses can actually um, do prior to try to minimize some of that, that fraud risk. Then we'll get into uh, prevention techniques, um, talking about you know sort sort of these top seven controls that businesses should all be following at this point, and then uh, we'll end with fraud detection techniques as well. So, um, you know, I think that the, the techniques we'll be talking about it's not earth shattering stuff. Hopefully, a lot of your your organizations and businesses are already following it. Um, but we'll talk through that. And uh, again, if, if there's any questions throughout, we'll, we'll try to answer that. So the first point question we have is really just in general, what's keeping you up at night? And you know, there's four answers here. So if you can answer those, um, I would assume a lot of business owners and, and CEOs and presidents and executives probably can check all of these, but, you know, what's the one that is really um, at the top of your list is what we're trying to get to. So it's cyber fraud, which we'll, we'll get into, Mike Schaffner, we'll get into pretty in good, good detail. Staff workload retention, obviously, you know, we're seeing that throughout all businesses and in the environment we're in right now. Obviously, we'll be talking about the remote work side of it. Um, you know, our business is still in remote. Are they not? Are they doing a hybrid approach? You know, the uh, HW company right now is doing sort of a hybrid. We have a hybrid policy. So we're doing a few days in the office, a few days out of the office and try to coordinate, coordinate that with, with staff and, and managers. Um, and the last one is just internal control and then just the changes and, and all of that related to potentially, you know, all the resources that were, were changed uh, with the pandemic. I'll give it a few more seconds before we show the results. I think we're good. So I think we can show the results. And probably not surprisingly, uh, staff workload, retention, um, talent, all of that stuff that a lot of businesses are working through, have been working through for several years, but it's just been heightened right now, just obviously with the pandemic and you know, with some of the uh, federal stimulus and all of that coming through to a lot of individuals. So thanks for sharing that. Okay. So, you know, with specific fraud risks, um, I think the two key areas we're going to, we're going to dig into, you know, Mike's going to talk about cybersecurity, cyber fraud, uh, you know, we'll talk about just a lot with that, you know, how to remedi remediate it, things like that. Um, you know, you don't, you know, every day you're hearing things that, you know, the businesses are being hacked in and, 
and all of that, and there is cyber fraud happening. So th that's very on the top of the list for a lot of us, being a CPA firm, working with businesses and trying to help businesses out with that. The next one is just occupational fraud. Um, and within that is you know, specific to misappropriation of assets. So you know, that'd be theft, you know, embezzlement, things like that from the business. And then the, the second item would be financial statement fraud. So, you know, in other words, you hear about cooking the books. So, you know, we, um, in this environment we're in right now, um, you know, there is a lot of risk out there for that. And, you know, we'll talk about this fraud triangle. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of pressure on, on organizations to perform how they performed prior to the pandemic. Um, and in certain industries, it's very hard to do that. And, you know, they still have requirements with banks and debt covenants and, um, you know, they have stakeholders and, and board members wanting to see the organization perform well. So there could be some incentive to have, um, you know, have some financial limit fraud occur within the organization. So we'll kind of talk through that. Some of the factors you can see, and you know, obviously shifting the resources with the pandemic, you know, going remote. Um, you know, a lot of the resources went to IT and trying to understand that and, you know, virtual platforms and all of that. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of changes there. And then, you know, overall furloughs and job cuts during the pandemic um, heightened, the, heightened the, the fraud risk area as well. And then you know, if you think about it, you know, a lot of people going remote and going home and working you don't have that office environment anymore where you tend to see maybe some supervision and oversight, you know, in person, you know, someone couldn't just walk down the hall and talk to somebody and see what they're doing and how things are going anymore. You had to go through a virtual platform or a phone call. So, you know, you tend to see a little less supervision oversight overall from supervisors, managers, bosses, things like that. So, you know, when you, when you tend to see that, then, you know, that does increase risk because then the perception is no one's overseeing me. Maybe I can do something wrong here. So, so we'll, you know, kind of, we'll talk about that several times during this presentation. Next, you know, some of the questions that businesses, businesses should have asked and, you know, really, you know, should be asking going forward as well on a periodic basis. You know, how did the daily tasks change with going remote, right? I'm sure a lot of your, a lot of businesses are asking that or have asked that. So, Trying to understand how does that change just the overall environment, just office environment, remote environment. Are there physical constraints with going remote or being in the office half the time, things like that? Um, you know, a lot of this gets to the IT side as well. The the prevention of theft of you know business assets, you know, with the changeover to remote and some people working in the office or doing a hybrid approach, how does that change the prevention? of businesses and reducing that risk of theft. Um, communications to employees change, right? You know, previously you'd have everyone in a room, you, you talk through, you know, your anti-theft policies and, and things like that. Um, now it might be very hard to do that. So how, how is that changing? Can you do it virtually? Can you do it in small groups, things like that? And then as I mentioned earlier, you know, with supervision, how, how does that changing supervision? Um, our supervisors, supervisors being just overwhelmed now with, uh, with uh, you know, virtual meetings now, day in and day out, back and forth, and trying to supervise, um, you know, their, their people and staff, and can they do their own day-to-day -day stuff now with all the supervision that, that is uh, kind of heightened now because of the virtual, virtual environment. And then lastly, we'll talk a few times about this throughout the session here, but that, that a tip hotline. Um, and you'll see some statistics about that. You know, a tip hotline for an organization is very important. It gives uh, a person an avenue to provide information, potentially about fraud, fraud or other things. And, um, you know, that's one of the key things that I think every business really should have is a tip hotline. And not only having a tip hotline, but communicating that out to um, employees and, and outsiders as well as the organization. And we'll talk a few times about that today. Second point question is how much of your staff are still working partially or fully remote? Give it a 15 seconds or so for everyone to answer. 
as I said earlier, you know, HIV company around right now is sort of doing like a, a partial hybrid approach right now. That's sort of the policy right now at this point, and it seems like it's working pretty well. But again, it comes back to communication, right? The communication is key with that approach. Okay, we can show the results. Okay, so about, it looks like a good portion has some sort of, you know, partial kind of remote, you know, in and out kind of thing, which is good. Um, and then, you know, a good portion of you, 75% or more as well. So it's, it's all kind of across the board. Now, I do believe I need to provide codes, code words. So the first code word here is I'm going to show is remote. So make sure to jot that down. Um, first code word being remote, you'll have to include that in the survey that pops up after this session. So again, first code word is remote. Okay, if we can close the results. And next we have cybersecurity and cyber fraud, and Mike Schaffner will get into that. You want to put yours up? Good morning, everyone. The uh, topics we're going to go through now are some of the cybersecurity and cyber fraud pieces. And basically, what we need to think about when you're talking about cybersecurity and fraud are control. Basically, who's got access to what systems, what hardware is being used by those systems. And where is the data? Is it moving around? Where is it stored? How is it accessed? In order to kind of put all this together, we need to be monitoring activities that are showing on the network, as well as keep track of what our big threat areas are and dealing with how to mitigate those threats. And all of that is normally tied up into a whole big written information security set of policies. It's kind of the, the list of policies and procedures that net lists all that together so that you've got a framework to be able to guide the day-to-day -day actions. When we all started going remotely, one of the big things that changed, as Tony had talked about, were security policies, equipment, password rules, things like Windows updates, antivirus updates, the whole procedure and supervision or lack thereof. All of that drastically changed when all of a sudden all the computer hardware sort of left the four walls of the office and people started working remotely. But these things also apply if you're still inside the four walls of your normal office because there has to be policies in place, password rules. You need to make sure security updates are done timely as well as antivirus updates and things like that. One of the big issues that came up with the remote workforce was BYOD for bring your own device. A lot of people had to go remote, started using home computers, their own laptops. During normal days, people might be using their own cell phone to access email or other corporate resources. So there needs to be some device management in place. There needs to be a way to control what access those things have to your information. There needs to be policies in place to make sure that a cell phone is encrypted so that if it does have the corporate email on it and that cell phone is lost or stolen, you don't have any worry about somebody being able to break into it and read everybody's email. Password requirements, lock screens, timeouts, everything that you normally would have found with your corporate desktop computer needs to be carried over to a BYOD situation to make sure we keep that chain of security in place and there's no weakest link. One of the other big things to be able to do is have a remote wipe of information so if that device is stolen or lost, IT can simply send out a command that will have the device delete all of the corporate information that's on there so that no matter what happens to the phone, you don't have to worry about a potential breach issue because that information is wiped out. Kind of hand in hand with that is the ability to set up a secondary area on the phone that is only accessible to the corporate data. Again, it's just trying to build walls between all of the personal information as well as the corporate stuff. So there's a way to make sure both are secure. 
everything has kind of been in the news recently. Everybody has heard about ransomware. It seems to make the headlines almost every day. Email phishing campaigns are usually what kind of start off ransomware, where you get inundated with fake emails that you've got a package being delivered or your invoice or your DocuSign documents ready for signing. Business email compromise is a little more specific, where that would be where the controller or the bookkeeper gets a desperate email from who they think is the CEO, the CFO, or the company that says, quick, transfer me $10,000 into an account. We had some pressing issue. I can't go through the normal channels. Here's that account number. Please send me that money. Wire fraud would be the same kind of thing where you literally, somebody is simply giving you invalid destination things and the controls are lax and all of a sudden something goes wrong. Tony talked about some of the, the fraud issues with people inside, embezzlement, insider threats that without good oversight over remote workers, or if some of the supervisors are working remote, but some of the bookkeeping type staff might be internal. Again, it's just a question of where's the oversight and where's the supervision. Stolen equipment is always an issue. We're always worried about losing a laptop or a cell phone, but as everybody went remote, we had to start worrying about, well, is everybody's apartment, their house, their condo, wherever they're working from remote, is that a secure location? It's easy to kind of say, yes, our offices are secure, but as everybody goes remote and you end up with, in effect, you know, 50 separate remote offices, it's harder to keep track of things. When something does go wrong, we kind of all know what can, what can happen, that some of the big things are, you know, loss of reputation, word gets out that you've had some kind of security problem, kind of getting a little bit worse would be litigation. There starts to be lawsuits going back and forth about how that information was, was stolen. Why did it get out? Depending upon the regulatory atmosphere, there could be fines for having security lapses. It's obviously a major disruption of business. We've all seen where ransomware can shut down companies for weeks to months to forever. On top of that, once something does go wrong, you are liable to be subject to future enhanced audits and scrutiny that whatever regulation got messed up, if you will, all of a sudden, maybe you're going to face three to four years of, of yearly audits now to prove your compliance. And then kind of the bottom one is the dollar signs that there's usually financial losses involved. And that's either just through direct loss of funds, or it's because of the cost of having to respond to a security breach, where there might have to be attorneys hired, forensic stuff done, notification to people whose information was breached, all of that can add up pretty quickly. Talked a little bit about business email compromise just a couple slides ago, but basically that's when somebody is trying to induce an employee to do something out of their ordinary day of business. The email usually appears to be for real, that it looks like it's really coming from the head of the company, from the president. But there should always be some secondary means to validate something like that. Literally as simple as pick up the phone and call someone to verify that, yeah, did you really send me that email that you really want $100,000 sent to this strange account that we've never done before? You never want to just trust that email to come through. It's too easy nowadays for somebody to spoof that email and make it look like it truly is a legit email coming from within the company. So there always should be a secondary means to validate instructions. Social engineering is a big thing there because by looking at people's Facebook accounts or LinkedIn, other posting pictures everywhere, they could figure out that, oh yeah, this, this president is actually on vacation somewhere in Florida. So it would make sense that they're trying to do something out of the ordinary and maybe a bookkeeper's not paying enough attention. They know that everybody said the president's off on vacation, but there always needs to be that secondary needs to validate those things. Email threats, everybody's heard over and over again, kind of emails are our worst enemy, but yet it's a necessary use during day-to-day -day life in this day and age. You want to make sure that you're never opening up attachments or links in unsolicited emails. You want to make sure that you know who that sender is. Is it something you're expecting before you just keep clicking? You also don't want to respond to a suspicious email in any manner. It does no good to try to click that link at the bottom that says unsubscribe me. More than likely, that's really not unsubscribing you. It's simply confirming to the spammer that you're real, and now you're going to get tenfold coming into your inbox the next day. One good thing to try to do is never look at email 
on a same computer that's got the ability to initiate or approve payments. So if you're doing remote banking, ECH transfers, any kind of delicate financial work, it would be best to not access email on that machine so that if something does go wrong and an email comes in, somebody clicks inadvertently and something gets compromised, you don't have to worry about that that's the computer that actually can transfer money because it's used to do that every day. You always want to record suspicious emails that come in. The big reason for that is somebody else is going to get it as well. So here at HW, what will happen is if one person gets it, we'll notify our IT department. They'll look at it, verify, yeah, this really is not a good email. And we'll get out a broadcast to everybody in the office to say, hey, if you see this email, please just delete it. Do not click on it. One other big thing to kind of remember is almost half of all malicious email attachments are office files. In the perfect world, you could block all attachments and you would reduce your threat tremendously, but we all know that's just impossible. Email attachments have to exist. People are sending spreadsheets, Word documents, PDF files. They're just used in day-to-day -day life. So we have to make sure we've got things in place to deal with that potential threat. Phishing email traits, things you can always look for is if there's tons of attachments on an email, there's some kind of false sense of urgency, you have three hours to act or your account is being locked. If you don't do something, they're going to come arrest you. The, the grammar might be incorrect or the offer is too good to be true that if you click on this link and send us a dollar, we'll get you $10,000 by tomorrow. It's coming from a weird sender, you don't recognize who it is. You'll always want to be careful of hyperlinks where if you click, you go off to somewhere else. You, you can never be too careful when you're clicking on those. Likewise, something would be generic, that there's a generic term in it or a generic salutation. In other words, it's dear client instead of, hey, Mike Schaffner, this is about your specific account. So you just always want to look at an email and make sure it doesn't make sense. Why am I getting this? As we're looking at emails, this is just kind of a generic example of what can be wrong as you're looking at a simple email. Some of the things people do is like if you notice at the very top of this one, the word Amazon is spelled wrong. Yet if you look quickly at it, it's hard to tell because the A is missing deep in the middle of it. And at first glance, that might look like it's okay. But as we look further into the email, it's coming up with dear client. Well, if this is talking about my Amazon account, they certainly know who I am. It should have said, dear Mike, dear Mr. Schaffner, dear something, not just client. Down in the middle toward the bottom is one of those hyperlinks that I talked about a couple seconds ago. That looks like it's a perfectly legit thing. It's got the word Amazon and it. it. Looks like I should go do that. But if I hover over it with my mouse, what will really pop up and show me what it really is, is that HTTP redirect.crazyname.com. So you always want to make sure you look at what's in the hyperlink before you actually click on it. As we're looking at those hyperlinks, some of the things that you need to kind of pay attention to is, is what that big string of gobbledygook that pops up every time you hover over it. Sometimes it can be really, really long and be scrolling way off the right side of the screen. But what you really need to look for that kind of breaks it down to the most important part is you want to start at the left and go to the right until you find that first slash. And in this case, it's after that dot com. And what you're looking for is what's between the first two and that one, which in here you can say, see says www.examplurl.com. And what that really is, is what's called the host name. And that's who you're really dealing with. And why that's important is if you look down at the kind of toward the bottom, I put in a fake URL that says www.email-content.somethingelse.reallylong.chase.com, then that slash email.html. Well, that's probably okay because that really is going to Chase's email website. The one below it in red is equally as crazy long, still has the word Chase in it, but it ends with a crazy Beachwood33k3.com, which certainly has nothing to do with Chase. So no matter where I think I'm going, I'm not going to end up where I need to be. So it's just kind of a quick way to look at the stuff between those first two slashes and then the first single slash. Make sure you realize what that is. The other big way to deal with hyperlinks is go directly to, in this case, if this was a Chase link, go to the Chase website and navigate from there. 
don't believe the email link if there's any other way around it. Security incidents, unfortunately, are happening kind of all the time. And some of the things that we need to pay attention to is it takes seconds or minutes for things to go wrong, but yet it can take days, months, even sometimes years for that problem to be discovered. One of the things that started to skew a lot of the statistics for breaches is ransomware. Because ransomware is when you click on that crazy email, something goes wrong, and an outside actor comes in and encrypts your whole network. Well, that happens fairly quickly, that by the time an hour has gone by, your network no longer works. So the time for discovery in that case is literally going to be minutes or, or hours. Whereas if it's somebody that's infiltrated your network and is kind of hanging out in the background just reading emails, browsing files, that may take you months or even years before you realize something is wrong. So some of the statistics down here, 12 days to occurrence, zero days to containment, the forensic and the notification have all been pretty much dropped in half from what they were a couple of years ago, but most of that is due to the ransomware piece. In order to know what's wrong, to deal with incidents and breaches and how to respond, you have to have a way to figure out what's going on. In other words, you need to be able to look for unusual computer activity, employees doing something differently. Some obvious things are loss of equipment, but that's sometimes not as obvious because if somebody's working remotely, you may not realize that their computer was stolen. Completely different than if you're in your office and if you walk by somebody's desk, you realize, wait, there should be a desktop computer sitting there. Policy violations, the same way. They're a little harder to, to keep track of when somebody's working remotely versus when somebody is internal. Pretty much the, the biggest things you can do to, to mitigate the ability to do fraud or have fraud happen or have security issues is to use complex passwords. You should be using one, a different one for every site. The longer, the better. So consider phrases. So don't try to come up with a crazy 26 digit password that's got, you know, full of symbols and uppercase and lowercase. Instead, put, pick a couple basic keywords like computers, pound sign, raining underscore Columbus, something you might remember. Still, it's pretty long. It's got upper and lower characters. You can pepper in punctuation, makes it very secure. The other big thing is to use a password manager. There's no way in the world you're going to remember sufficiently complex passwords across the hundreds of places you now have to use them. You also don't want to use the same login. Not only keep a different password, but don't have the same login every time. And you really want to try to not use your email address only because that ties it to you. And if some, some external site is hacked and you're part of the Target breach or the Home Depot breaches in the past, they now know that that's a legitimate login for Mike Schaffner. And what they're first thing they're going to do is try that on every site they can think of. So if I've used my Schaffner at Halco.com email through 100 different sites, that just gives them an easier way to get to the front door. You never want to share passwords or logins. That kind of goes without saying. Don't trust any email links. Talked about that a little bit before, that it's really better to go to the source and navigate instead of trying to go from an email. Second factor authentication was where you get the code back on your phone or you use an authentication app, which is just a, a second way to say, this is really who I, I say I am. And where that'll help you out is if somebody does get your password and your login, and they try to log into your corporate email account, your cell phone will get a notification to say, hey, is this you? Are you really trying to log in? You can answer no, that'll stop them from being able to break into your account. And that way it's again, a second piece of authentication to prove who you are. It's always a good idea to keep your inbox clean. The less email that's in your inbox, the less cluttered things are. You always want to lock out or log, log out of your workstation when you leave, but you don't want to leave a screen up with any kind of information on it. And the same goes for your phone. If your phone's got corporate email on it, you don't want to leave your phone laying around. The biggest thing on this thing, and it's in red, is to never input your work credentials on any external site. There's a lot of times nowadays you've got it. It's a legitimate work account, but it's on some other vendor's site. You never want to use your network credentials. And if you think about that for a second, some company out there that you're doing legitimate business work, business with, 
has no idea what your network login credentials are back at the office. There is no reason to ever put those in anywhere. No matter how tempting the login screen looks like, never put those in. Any kind of external flash drive, we always want to make sure they're encrypted. That way, if you lose it, you don't have to worry about what was on there that somebody could pick up and use. BitLocker is a quick example built into almost every Windows machine and anywhere that's out there. Quick and easy to do, keeps it secure. You also want to never send confidential information through regular email. You always want to make sure it's encrypted through some third-party way, using a portal, some way to make sure that you're not just sending confidential stuff blindly across the Internet. And the one, you know, the one item here that I'm hearing a lot about is the second factor authentication. Um, and, and what I'm hearing, Mike, too, is that there's a lot of companies now, like software companies that are just, it's mandatory to have some, some sort of second factor authentication. What yes, hearing. it is becoming more and more prevalent. And it's even going a step further that a lot of the cyber security insurance companies are requiring you to kind of attest to that as you fill out the insurance apps. And they won't even offer insurance to you if you don't have second factor in place on the crucial pieces like remote access into various systems on the network. Okay. Well, the, the third point question, um, you know, is does your organization have cybersecurity insurance? And we'll talk about uh, controls and, you know, the different types of controls, prevention, detection. You know, this would be one of those controls in place that you have insurance for a breach, uh, cyber fraud that would cover any potential losses potentially that you, that could, could occur with a, a cyber fraud. So, and we'll get into that and what that means. We'll give it, I mean, more 10 seconds or so. You can uh, close out and show the results. Looks like a good portion of you are that you that have the cybersecurity insurance, which is good. Close the results. All right, thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Appreciate it. Um, so then, you know, we're going to be getting into some of the fraud aspects now, specific, not just specific to cyber fraud, but just in general as well. But um, the fraud triangle, as I mentioned earlier. You have three aspects to this. It's the pressure on an individual or an organization. There's an opportunity to commit fraud, you know, either with controls not in place, uh, lack of segregation of duties, things like that. And then either the individual or the organization rationalizes that behavior for some reason or so. So, um, you know, typically when you see a fraud case, you see these three aspects in every one of them. Pressures, we'll start with pressure. So, you know, the personal side, the individual side, you can just see, obviously, there's a, a, a whole list of them, of pressures. You know, the, the one major one that we typically see in cases is, you know, the standard of living, living beyond means, that sort of thing. Um, that, that is one of the pressures that are in a lot of these fraud cases. Um, you know, one of the questions you ask yourself now is, well, you know, with people going remote, and some of the change, you know, the changes in the environment, the office environment, and all that. How does that change the pressure with individuals, right? Um, and it could be, you know, it could be more heightened pressure, or it could just be something else that's really, um, you know, pushing individuals to commit fraud. So I think a lot of businesses really should think about that. You know, one of the aspects is, you know, when you're in the office. You know, you're you're conversing with people in person, you know, face to face, talking through. You can see, um, you know, not only just you know the the conversation, but you know what they're doing as well. So you can see exactly maybe there's there is some pressure on someone now. If once if someone's remote and you're only talking through them with, you know, a phone call, you don't see those those mannerisms at times. So you know, it is a little bit difficult now with people remote and not in person to really understand okay, well, what kind of pressures potentially individuals are having um, either, you know, at the office or at home as well. Some of the organizational pressures, um, you can see, obviously, we talked about staffing, right, all the staffing issues, retention, 
um, you know, the talent um, pool and all that. It's just very difficult with a lot of businesses right now. Um, the workload increasing for a lot of individuals because of the job cuts and things as well. Um, reimbursement reductions, um, you see that at you know, the one, of the one of the things here is the increases in costs, right? Obviously, a lot of businesses had increases in costs with PPE, with going remote, and then having IT hardware, software um, costs on top of just the day-to-day -day stuff as well. So increases in costs, which then obviously um, hurts the bottom line. And then the last one here is regulatory pressures, compliance. You know, with all of the stimulus that came out to organizations with Paycheck Protection Program funds and um, um, provider relief funds and all the CARES Act money, um, employee retention credits and other tax credits. There's a lot of compliance out there now um, that organizations really have are required to follow. Um, so you really have to have you know, someone close to you, either in, in, internally or outside and um, that's close to you that really understands those requirements and what, what they have to do as an organization to either keep the funds, um, have those funds forgiven, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of, right now, especially right now, there's a lot of compliance out there that, you know, or, an organization really needs to be on top of. And then moving into, you know, we talked about pressures, um, you know, and we talked about, you know, the, the, and we'll talk about the rationalization, but really you have to have some opportunity to commit the fraud. And that's either individually or as an organization. And what happens is if you increase internal controls and procedures um, and, you know, have less opportunities then or less, you know, have more internal controls, then that re reduces the opportunities for individuals or organizations to commit the fraud, okay? And I mean, we all know, you know, a lot of nonprofits may not have the resources, may not have the people to be able to segregate duties completely 100%. And, you know, as a CPA firm, we understand that. But you try to understand, okay, well, what can we do where it makes sense, where it can, it can minimize our risk overall, um, and we can kind of move forward. And there's always a cost benefit with you know, uh, implementing internal controls. So you have to look at that, too, is, you know, if I implement this control, how much is it going to cost me either time-wise or dollar-wise? And is it worth the squeeze? Is it worth it that, you know, if we do implement this, how much risk is, is my business reducing in fraud? So there's a lot of things that you have to do that. And, you know, the full, we talk about risk assessment and organizations should be doing risk assessments overall. And really this is what that is, looking at your procedures, looking at tasks and duties, and then prioritizing those where you really need a control here, but like, hey, well, maybe we just get insurance, like that cybersecurity insurance. Maybe we just get insurance here where then if it, there is a breach, it, it would minimize the loss overall for an organization. Now, we're not saying that you shouldn't do what Mike was saying, you know, having firewalls and all of that. You should have all that as well. But you get to a point where the, the cost is just way too high. And at that point, you have to do have, have something else behind it like insurance. And then lastly, the rationalization, you know, a lot of individuals then rationalize their behavior, right? Just, you know, this is why I did it, right? Um, they, they maybe they they know they're doing something wrong, but there's something behind them that you know we're, I'll rationalize that because of this. The one thing here in this environment is, you know, a lot of businesses received all these funds, and you know they were they were they were very highly liquid. Their balance sheet looked very strong, a lot of cash, a lot of that on their balance sheet. So you know um, employees see that and say, well, wait, you know we're not you, you know we don't need all that cash. You know why why do we have so much cash and they're getting all this free money? Why can't I get some of it? So that's how you rationalize the behavior where if there's an opportunity, uh, individuals may take that opportunity um, and even good people do it as well. So some fraud prevention techniques. Um, so we have a graph here. This is, the, this is statistics from the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners report to the nations. They do this every two years. And they, certify, they, they, they do a survey of all CFEs and all the cases they've done. And there's thousands of cases that come in and they do all these questions. And one of the questions is, well, what was the primary weakness that was observed with the fraud? And you can see here, the highest percentage is lack of internal controls. There wasn't controls in place to either prevent the fraud 
or detect it or just reduce the risk somehow, some way. So you can see that, that that's, very, that's very important for organizations. Also, over, overriding control is very important you know, to understand. Are, are there people just overriding controls completely, and can they do it? And then as you talked about earlier, you know, the oversight, lack of management review, that's a high percentage as well. So that's very key items to really understand in your, in your organization um, and try to, to you know, figure that out. Some of the questions you can see asking your, your organization, you should do, ask, ask all your employees in your business office for sure of, you know, what's going on? You know, you know as, an, as an auditor, we ask questions on, on fraud as well to just to, to business office people, staff as well. Just like, how can you, do you have an area where you can actually steal? Um, now, do we get answers that say, yeah, here's a here's a here's an area where we can where this is where we can fill. Sometimes we do actually, and then we get that and we provide that to the organization, and then hopefully, you know, at that point, then they they try to you know change that 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 task or that duty. But a lot of the questions um, that businesses should be asking, one of the key ones here is: Is there a fraud reporting mechanism? As we talked about before, is it is there a tip hotline? Okay, so that's one of the very important items that businesses should be asking if they don't have it, you know, uh, maybe you should consider um, implementing that. There's a, there's a checklist on our HWCO's website that goes through questions. It's only like a two page question questionnaire. It goes through questions that businesses should be asking themselves probably annually at least. So, you know, go ahead and uh, pull that down if you'd like. Seven important best practice controls. Um, you know, I think the first item here, having a policy for check signers, ACH approval, very important, obviously, right? So having a policy in place and then not overriding that. Let's not override those controls. Um, the one key item here is if there's checks, check processing, that check should not be going back to, um, should not be going back to uh, the AP person or the person that processed the check after it was signed because there could be misappropriation or opportunity for misappropriation there. One of the key items here that, like, if you're not doing this, you should be, is bank statement, cancel check review. And everyone has online access now for the most part. So someone at a higher level and, you know, the preferable person there is the person that signs the checks should have access. And it, maybe it's just, you know, uh, administrative access. You can't do anything within there. But they can look at canceled checks. They can kind of take a look at them, see if there's any, you know, any just odd vendors that they don't recognize, things like that. So I would recommend that all businesses do that. You don't have to look at every canceled check, but it would be good to have that perception to the, the staff that there is some oversight there. Payroll processor, obviously payroll servicer is very important, direct deposit. Um, Approved vendor list is very important. So if you have a vendor list, you should be going in your vendor list at least annually and reviewing, reviewing your vendors. If you're not using a vendor for three, four, five years, why are they still on there, right? So um, reviewing vendor lists. A key item too is balance sheet reconciliation, um, you know, monthly close, having worksheets and support for your balance sheet accounts is very important. Um, a lot, you know, I think most nonprofits have budgets. So, and I think most of you on this call probably are, are doing this is comparing budgets to actual what's going on with fluctuation, having questions asked back to the controller, CFO, back to um, the, the process of the financial statements to understand what's going on. And then Mike was talking about, you know, email, wire transfer fraud, phishing attacks and all that. You know, what I tell my clients is, you know, maybe just have people just, if they don't really recognize an email or just to look, it looks, just, it looks odd, pick up the phone and call them. And say, hey, did you send just send me an email to wire fifty thousand dollars? So just stuff like that that people can do that, that that would help reduce the risk. And then just oversight, as I talked about, oversight is very key, keeping that very high on everyone's list. Fraud detection. So as we talked about tips, you can see here this is from the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners survey cases. You know the highest percentage of detection is tips. So that's why I come back to you have to have a tip hotline. Here are the sources. You can see mostly as employees, which makes sense. But you do also, you know, you can see customers, vendors, competitors, even providing sources of fraud. So not only providing the tip hotline to employees, but you're going to provide this out to all of your contacts as well that you work with. So they have an avenue to provide 
um, you know, and fight back to you and the organization. Talking about, again, the tips again here, very key. The one thing I wanted to mention here is data analysis. You know, as an, as an audit firm, as a CPA firm, we do a lot of data analysis. And, you know, not only just for audits, but we do for uh, clients as well, just data mining, you know, understanding the data, and it does risk scoring of an analysis. And then you can hone in on the higher risk areas of transactions and things. So that could be something that businesses consider going forward, not just at audit time, but throughout the year as well. Last polling question, does your organization use a tip hotline? We have two minutes, so I think we're on we're on time here. Um, do I need to show another code? Probably right, word code. So the next word code here is hotline. So that's, I guess that's the second one. And I'll have a final one in here in the last two minutes. So the first one's remote, second one's hotline. Okay, I'm gonna show the results. And about half don't have a tip hotline. So I think, you know, I would recommend, there's organizations out there that you can contract it out. And, you know, they kind of go through just the first overall review and then anything that comes through that they, they think that should be followed up on, they send that to the, either your compliance officer or someone to review. So, um, you know, we have an organization um, that, that we refer clients to that, that they can use that organization. It's not affiliated with us. It's just someone outside uh, HW and company. So just let me know if, the, if anyone needs that. And then lastly here, like the takeaway items here, you know, I think, you know, Mike was talking about really, you know, like all these items with cybersecurity, you know, so really educating your employees is very key, you know, making sure they know that, you know, if an email comes in, they don't really recognize, they really need to understand that, and then communicate that to IT or whoever about that. Um, you know, we talked about password policies and second factor authentication, email control is very important. Internal controls are very important overall. Oversight, we talked about several times. And then lastly, if, if you just if you have one takeaway from this whole session, a tip hotline. Every organization should have it and you should implement it and communicate it out to everyone that you're in contact with. With that, I'm gonna pass it back over to Helen. I appreciate everyone's time. Okay, thank you, Tony and Mike. Great information, even if sometimes a little scary to hear. Um, our next session will begin at 10 o'clock. As a reminder, when this session um, ends and prior to that one, you will see on your screen an option. You're gonna either choose the financial option, which would be um, accounting and auditing update with John Krasansky, or you will see, um, you can choose the uh, management with Carrie Mollard. Um, so just be cognizant of that. If you somehow end up in the wrong room, you can always leave. And then when you log back in, you will get the pop-up and, and to, to choose and we can we place you where you wanna be. Um, take for those of you getting CPE credit, note those uh, words. If somehow you don't get it, put it in the chat or email me and um, just let me know you missed it and, and we'll make a note of that. Um, and put it in your survey. If you have the survey from yesterday, you can input it now. If not, we will be sending it back out again um, after the session. So with that, uh, go get your coffee and we will see you back here at 10 a.m.